afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session. Uh, my name is Gordon Carrera. Uh, I'm a, uh, a broadcaster, a writer on um, security and intelligence issues, and it's precisely because I know how difficult that can be that I'm so pleased to be able to talk to Roland Bergman uh, next to me this afternoon uh, about his book, uh, Rise and Kill First, uh, The Secret History of Israel's Targeted uh, Assassinations. It's, uh, it's uh, a, a topic worthy of uh, plenty of time and attention. I'll make sure there's some time for questions from you at the end. But what I want to do is kind of look at some of the, the stories, the triumphs, the tragedies, but also look at the, the ethics and the efficacy of, of uh, this uh, tool that Israel has uh, really kind of pioneered, I think. Uh, uh, before we get into the history, uh, let's start with a recent case. Uh, I remember last November getting called up by my news desk and they said uh, uh, there was a story out of Iran that a scientist had been killed, a man called Mohsen Fakhrizadeh, known to those of us who follow kind of Iran and nuclear programs, and it was very unclear what had happened to him uh, and how he died. Now, you've done the story. What, what happened in that operation? Give us a sense of, of, of what, what took place. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for coming. <laughs> You've written Oops. about it. Come on. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll think about this in a minute. I just wanted to, first of all, thank you. Uh, and thanks for the kind words. And uh, thanks uh, to the festival for inviting me. And you know, looking at uh, you, and I'm just thinking what to uh, answer you. And in the, in the meantime, I'll tell you a story about the dress code. Every time before I go to speak with non Israelis, I, uh, I stand puzzled in front of the closet thinking what I should wear. <laughs> Israelis are not very um, you know, updated with dress codes, etc. I never know what to, what to wear. Should I put a suit, a jacket, or a tie? But looking at you and everybody else, I know I made the right call and I didn't put a tie, <laughs> which is good. Um, there was a spy, a British spy, called Godievsky, Oli Godievsky. Uh, which uh, just uh, a new book just came about him and uh, how he maybe saved the world from his third uh, world war. Um, and after he defected to Britain, he was asked to fly to Israel for debrief Mossad. This was 1984, the debrief Mossad of what the Russians are planning against Israel. Uh, Israel was high on the target list of the KGB. And then he... Um, he said, recalling that flight, he said, there I was flying 747, first class, on the expenses of Mossad. And I, said, I noticed something very odd. The booths were free, but I was the only one drinking. And then when I reached Israel, I realized that this is the country with the smallest number of two things, drunk people and ties. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is about, about dress code. Um, to your question, um, Fakhri Zadeh was the most guarded person in Iran. He was, they knew that he's prime on Israeli most wanted list. They know that they knew, the Iranians knew that the Israelis are planning to kill him. They had seven cars escorting him, armored, the best security details the Revolutionary Guard can, can bring. Heavy armored, heavy um, machine guns, and yet he was killed. Now, a few days, when the, the first news, maybe you recall, where that he was killed during a, a gun battle, that some of the assassins were either caught or killed, and those who were caught are under interrogation. This was replaced um, just uh, maybe two days after with a new story that no one was caught because the Revolutionary Guard said it was a robot, a robot <laughs> killer that was put on the sideway where he was traveling and killed him. Now, everybody in Iran, knowing that the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, are uh, lying all the time, uh, they, they were sure that this is just an excuse. They were supposed to guard him. They failed. And now it's a robot. It's like force majeure. Like, what can you do against a robot that is controlled by satellite with some uh, artificial intelligence and face recognition, all uh, commanded from Tel Aviv, the story said. Um, but like with a, a jammed watch, sometimes they they get it right, and they tell the truth. And it was a robot. Uh, but maybe just to give a bit more context, just going back in time, 
because this was the end of a duel, a duel that took place 30, the last 30, dec 30 years, the last 30 decades, and it started in 1992 in a hotel room in Paris where a, um, a Lebanese French lawyer got in friendly relation, and that in, then in business relations with a young Iranian nuclear scientist. And that nuclear scientist gave him the blueprints that Iran just bought from Abdel Qadir Khan, the father of the Islamic Pakistani nuclear bomb. He died last week. That blueprint was the beginning of the Iranian nuclear project. Everything that we see now is the result of what happened that year of the proliferation of A.Q. Khan, who wanted to make money, the export of his doomsday uh, toys to Libya, to Iraq, to uh, North Korea, and to Iran. The, 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 uh, the lawyer was, of course, not a lawyer. He was a, a young case officer in the Mossad, codenamed Kalan. Kalan, uh, you know, when they uh, being recruited to Mossad, they are asked to choose a code name because inside the internal correspondent in Mossad, they don't use the, their own names. And he chose the name Kalan. I don't know uh, if anyone remembered in the early 70s, there was a TV series here in Britain uh, about a detective, Kalan. His name was Kalan, and he was like a lonely wolf. He was as opinionated to his subordinate as to his superiors. And I think that when, he, when this young guy was recruited to the Mossad 10 years earlier to meeting, to recruiting that young uh, uh, nuclear scientist, he thought he wants to be like Kalan. From that point, he returned with the blueprints to Israel and said, the Iranians are trying to build a bomb. In order to stop that, the Mossad planned to kill Abdel Qadir Khan. But the CIA said, if you kill him, oh, we got this, with this under our control. And he was not killed by, back then, and I think that many people regret maybe today that this could change history. Abdel Qadir Khan is one of those cases where you actually see a one person changing history. And the same with the guy who was the boss of the young nuclear scientist, Muhsin Fakhrizadeh, who became the head of the Iranian nuclear project. And from that day, there's a duel. Kalan, the young Mossad case officer in Israel, is trying to prevent Muhsin Fakhrizadeh from achieving his life goal building a nuclear Iranian bomb. 30 years, they were fighting each other all over the Middle East. And on the 27th of November, that duel ended when a robot killer assassinated Muhsin Fakhrizadeh. Kalan is the code name of the last veteran Mossad chief, Yossi Cohen. He was commanding the Mossad, and he ordered, uh, of course, with the blessing of the political, uh, leaders of the country. He ordered the killing of, of Mohsen Fakhri Zandeh. Now that killing will, I think, change the world of security because nowadays it's not a drone. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a land drone. Someone was able to take a huge infrastructure with a machine gun, with artificial intelligence uh, computers, with uh, communication um, equipment, with a lot of um, uh, other equipment and with huge explosives, smuggled them in pieces, small pieces, into Iran, one ton equipment, assembled that, calibrate, synchronize with the, uh, with the satellite, put on a Zamyad. Zamyad is a local, it's like a, a Nissan pickup, a local brand in Iran. Know when Fakhri Zadeh is going to travel and where. And on the last turn, during the weekend when he was just traveling to his, uh, uh, his weekend uh, house in a village, the command room in Tel Aviv saw Fakhri Zadeh, verified that it's him using artificial intelligence and face recognition and fired. Now, this, you know, I'm describing this as if it's nothing to do, but this is really, really hard first to get the equipment, but also just imagine that the transmission from the Zamya, from the, from the machine gun to the satellite and back to Tel Aviv takes 0.8 seconds. 
The sniper needs a little time to think, maybe like a quarter of a second, and then 0.8 back. So what the machine gun sees when the orders come back is different because the car also already moved away. The artificial intelligence is able to compensate for that. As for the, uh, the recoil of the, of the machine gun after the first gun is, is shot. And you see how precise, because only Fakhri Zadeh was killed, not his wife, uh, not the bodyguard. His wife just was sitting just beside him, not the bodyguard. Um, and of course, and I assume we will get to this uh, in a minute, but there is a lot of um, legal and moral debates about the killing of a nuclear scientist who at the end of the day didn't kill anyone, uh, was not involved in the killing of, of anyone and was a part of a, um, a scientific project of, of a sovereign country. But from a, I would say, an operational and intelligence point of view, that proved, I think, that there is no one who is immune, even if you put the most tight security in the most uh, guarded uh, state country in the world, if you are stubborn and you have the capabilities, you will get to him. You brought up at this moment the ethics of it, of going for scientists. What's, what's the justification from, from those who do it? Uh, 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 what, what's their approach? Because it's interesting, we've seen an evolution of the kinds of people that have been targeted over the years. But there's a difference, isn't there, between scientists and the, the if you like, the ticking bomb scenario, which most people understand when you've, uh, when, when you've got someone who's about to kill people. Um, it's illegal by the American law. The U.S. was not involved in the killing of, of Iranian scientists. And when Israel did that, the U.S. even made a statement that this is illegal. Uh, according to the U.S. law, assassinations, which are of a more political uh, kind, are forbidden, but targeted killings are uh, permitted. Uh, the Israeli law, the Israeli legal advisors to the defense establishment, they see very little difference between the two. If someone is leading, and this is very important from the Israeli perspective, the Israeli psyche, the Israeli mindset. If someone is leading a nuclear project that is aiming to produce nuclear weapon, and Fakhri Zadeh was not a small pin in, in a huge infrastructure. He was leading that for three decades. And he knew exactly what he was doing. And he was working. Mossad stole the Iranian nuclear archive from Iran in 2018. And there are uh, notes, handwritten notes, that he wrote with the exact instruction how to develop the miniaturization of a bomb to fit the uh, width of a so uh, the shoulders of Shihab 3 missile that can hit Israel. So there's no, no, uh, no dispute. But, of course, there is a legal and moral debate. Where is the line? And I, and I, and I understand that. And in 2009, when the first plan to kill him was just about to, to be executed in a, in a Mossad uh, meeting, a woman, a young intelligence officer, stood up and said, I have something to say that is not about the details of that specific operation. My father, she said, is senior with the Israeli Atomic Energy Committee. Now, if you say yes to kill Fakhri Zadeh, then it means that you say yes to killing my father, that he's also a legitimate target. And as you, know, as you can understand, uh, those remarks were maybe noted, but overruled. Uh, at the end of the day, there is nothing, I think, more at the heart of the consensus of, of the Israeli establishment, maybe the Israeli public, than to prevent and do whatever possible um, to destroy any kind of threat that is deemed to be existential. This is, this is the thing. You, you, you see everything. You know, Menachem Begin, when he ordered the Israeli uh, Air Force, based on Mossad, uh, operation to fly over to Iraq and destroy the Tammuz Osirak reactor in 1981. He said, we will never allow a country that is called for our destruction, is calling for our destruction to uh, um, develop the means to deliver a second annihilation. That's it. And the Menachem Begin doctrine, as they say, is valid today. And it's not just about Netanyahu. It's any, I think, any Israeli, other, any other Israeli prime minister would promote the same policy. We've just talked about something involving AI and land drones. I mean, your book really does the history. Uh, and one of the things I think that struck me reading it was that if you like, you know, this willingness to use this tool is baked in from the origin and from the origin story. And I mean, you start actually 
with uh, uh, the assassination of a British official, basically a British police officer. Yep. Uh, was it Tim Wilkin? Yeah. Tim, yeah. You know, in, 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 in the 1940s. Yeah, in Jerusalem. Yeah, look, there is a, a historical debate whether the uh, operations, killings, and terrorist attacks of the two splinter groups, uh, Etzel, that Menachem Begin uh, commanded, and this, the uh, Lehi, the, or as the British called it, the, the Stern Gang, um, whether that had an impact on history. But from the point of view, this is how that chapter, uh, the first chapter, I'm not going to do any spoiler, I hope everybody will mm -hmm. read the book. But, um, th this is the point that ends that chapter one. When the, the, the people who actually killed Wilkin, who later became uh, senior executives at the Mossad, they believed that what they did drove the Brits out of Palestine. And by the way, many in Israel are not sure that this was a good thing. They say about Haaretz, Haaretz is a very, you know, the New York Times of, of Israel, and they said that the last government that Haaretz supported is the British mandate. <laughs> um, and then the book kind of you see, and again, the scientists' theme is interesting because you have the targeting of the German scientists, I think, yep. in Egypt, which is a fascinating story in there, yep. isn't it? And so, so again, that's got quite deep roots. That's like everything together. You have the Holocaust and existential threats all together because <clears throat> Mossad did not see that veterans of Pinamunda, that island in the Baltic Sea where Hitler developed what he hoped would save in the Second World War, so the V1 and the V2, the, the mother and the grandmother of, this, of today's Scud. Um, so those scientists who worked in Pinamunda, left with no job after the war, uh, offered their services to Nasser. And he, he recruited them and surprised the Mossad with launching um, a, a missile as, as, a, as a test in uh, July of 1962. Um, and uh, said, I will destroy every target south of Beirut with those missiles. Now, you can look at the map and understand what is there south of, of Beirut. 1962, before the Six Day War, before Israel became some kind of a military regional superpower, before having its own nuclear arsenal, with the streets of Israel full with people still, you know, with the, with the number from Auschwitz, tattooed on their arm, hearing that the new Hitler, as Ben-Gurion called him, so I'm the Nasser of Egypt, recruited the uh, senior scientist of the old Hitler to deliver annihilation. Just imagine the extent of the hysteria. Imagine what, like, this was one of the major political scandals in, in, in the history of the country until then. Now, Mossad first tried to kill the, 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 the Germans, but this was not very well done, and, and Nasser offered much more money to those who survived, so they just, they just stayed. And it led to the resignation of the chief of the Mossad, and then the resignation of David Ben-Gurion. It ended his career. Um, and the new chief said, no, no, we have to stop. We need to assess what exactly is happening inside the nuclear uh, missile project of, of the Egyptian. We need to recruit one of those scientists. But how do you recruit a Nazi? Uh, and then one of the case officers came and said, listen, I have an idea, boss. There is a guy who is close. He's not a scientist, but he was a general of the SS. He's close to those scientists. If we recruit him, we will be able to get to them. His name is General of the SS, Otto Skorzeny, former chief of special operations for Hitler. So Chief of Mossad said, and you want to recruit this Otto? <laughs> He said, yes, I think I know how to get to him. Now, Mossad is very uh, famous for giving a long leash to the young case officers, as, as I told uh, before about uh, Yossi Cohen, Kalan. So the chief said, you know what? We don't have anything else. The prime minister is sitting on my neck. You go ahead, play your games, but you will be able to recruit this Nazi when I'll have a hair growing up here. So again, not spoil, it's only chapter five. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but just very, very short, to get to the end of the story, he, that case officer, um, is meeting with a few different people, ending up meeting with the wife of Otto, Otto Skorzeny, Countess Ilsa von Finkelstein, the, the niece of uh, Hitler's 
treasure secretary. And she and the, the, the Mossad um, also found out that she, she was a very interesting woman. She was selling documents to Nazi fugitives to flee to uh, South America, and she was arms dealer. But also, they said in the file that she and Otto had what I think is described as open marriage. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> because if not, I'm not going to tell you. I think. Let's assume we And the, the case officer, who is, who is described in you know, Mossad reports, they have uh, written a very long report about the whole case in their history, top secret, uh, which I have a copy of. <laughs> and in that report, which are usually very dry, he's described as a young, charismatic, tall case officer of German origin with a known influence on women at a certain age. <laughs> Whatever that means. <laughs> and um, they meet. The legend said that he, he sacrificed himself. <laughs> you, you understand what? Yeah? <laughs> um, and I asked him this. I, I met him. He was already, his name is Rafi Maidan. Um, I asked him, I said, Rafi, you know, the, the legend, the urban legend in Mossad said that you closed your eyes, you thought of the queen, and you did what you... Queen? <laughs> and he said, uh, Ronan, he died, I said, he said, Ronan, there are certain questions gentlemen do not ask, gentlemen do not answer. But it was a very nice night. <laughs> <laughs> After that night happens the unbelievable Ilsa von Finkelstein take the case officer to meet with Otto Skorzeny in Madrid, where he found refuge after he flee, um, he escaped the Nuremberg trial. And then a moment, maybe most, the most dramatic moment in the history of the, of the Mossad, Otto Skorzeny was commanding the SS battalions in Kristallnacht. That's an SS general. He was involved in the um, mass murder and the deportation of many people. And the Mossad came to him after a very uh, strong, severe debate at home whether he should be recruited or killed, because he was high in the list of Nazis that should be killed. But they decided to recruit him. And they were able to recruit him, not under false flag. They knew that this, this is a the trained intelligence officer. He will call the bluff if they pretend to be someone else. They said, we are from the Mossad. We want you to work for us. And it happens unbelievable. They were able to recruit the former commander of special operation for Adolf Hitler. Not for money, he was rich. Because they could offer him something that nobody else could. Life without fear. They gave him a letter of immunity from the Israeli prime minister, a new passport. And in exchange for that, he became the most valuable asset Mossad was running those years. He was able to disassemble the project of the German scientists in Egypt without a single fire shot. Unbelievable story. And there's plenty of unbelievable stories in, in, in the book like that. Um, the, 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 you have this period where you have quite specific targeted killings, including you know, most famously you know, after, after the Munich Olympics operation. But then when you come to the, to the Intifada, it, it's, it changes, doesn't it? You get targeted killing becomes <coughs> almost industrial. It becomes a kind of machine is built to do that. And you also, at that point, seem to get some ethical concerns from within the Israeli intelligence community, don't you, about, about the way it's being done then? I think, of course, you, you, you have the moral and, and sometimes legal, but basic, but more moral debates through the history, but when Israel decided that there is only one weapon that can defeat what was considered, and is considered until today by many countries, this undefeatable, the use, the extensive use by terrorist organization of suicide bombers. How do you stop someone who doesn't need to have any training, he gets, he puts on the suicide belt, he crossed the line, he bought a bus to get into a, a, a kindergarten or shopping mall, and he just moved the switch from off to on and explodes himself. How do you stop a person like that? You threaten that you kill him, he's, he's willing to die. And Israel in 2001 was facing a huge wave 
of those, killing thousands, injuring thousands. And at a certain point, the Israeli intelligence, and it's not just the Mossad, the Shin Bet, the domestic security service, they came and said there's only one way with which we can confront those. And this is the most extensive campaign of targeted killing ever launched in history. Not against the suicide bombers. Hamas boasted that they have more volunteers than suicide belts. But it turns out that if you kill the, the layers above those, so the communicators, the recruiters, the indoctrinators, the engineers making the bombs, the regional commanders, then the political level, you don't even need to kill all of them before you cripple the whole infrastructure. Because those people, you know, the people in charge, that have no, no problem with sending you know, people to the, the, their death and killing many others, when it's up to them, when the price tag is attached to them, they say, well, we'll die, but maybe another day. Not today. <laughs> they, they know that the story of, I'm just um, uh, quoting an Israeli general, that the story about the 72 virgins is yet to be proven, and they don't want to be those who are going to check. Um, and, and so when those were targeted, this was the only thing that made them stop. They, it made Hamas stop sending them, and at the end, signing a, 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 a truce or, or some kind of a ceasefire. Now, it comes with a very he heavy price. Most of those assassinations were done with drones. There was huge collateral damage. The collateral damage started the wave of protest and sometimes refusal to obey orders from uh, senior commanders by by the, by the IDF and, and, uh, and other intelligence services. And I must say, you know, there are a lot of, there's a lot of uh, blunders and heroism, successes and failures in, in Rise and Kill First. Um, it's not, if someone is looking for a book that glorifies Mossad, do not buy this one. Uh, sometimes the, the Israeli James Bond looks, like, looks more like Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> but, but, but um, I think for me, and uh, again, a lot of stories about heroism, but for me, those people who stood and disobeyed orders and said this is a manifested illegal order with, as the Israeli term, with the black flag hanged over that, because we are going to kill civilians, um, they are my heroes. Because there's a very, one very striking story where, where there's an operation going on and, and, and someone literally says no at that moment. No. You know, yeah. and, and they stop it as it's, as it's, as it's he about... He stopped it because yeah. he did not deliver the intelligence, which brings about the question of who pulls the trigger. Now, you have a, an aircraft, you have a pilot. He's 36,000 feet b b b uh, above ground and he pulls the trigger. But what does he know? Because of technology, because of telecom, because of the extensive use of Israeli in cyber and SIGINT, the authority to pull the, the trigger practically moves back. And you have an intelligence officer who knows who is going to kill. And he says, I'm not going to authorize. And he stops. He's just a, a, a lieutenant, a young lieutenant. He's 22 years old. And he stops an operation that much of the military is involved in. He said, I, 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 this is, this is. Because it's going to kill flat. civilians. Because we are going to kill civilians. Because there's a secretary there, and I'm not going to do that. And of course, he was court-martialed, he was kicked from the military. But those are my, from all the people mentioned in the book, those are my heroes. Um, there's another story where, in 2012, I had an interview with high rank um, Air Force uh, commander. And at a certain point, he said, you know, Ronan, now I like you, and I'm going to trust you and give you the most secretive operation in the history of the Air Force. But you have to promise me that after I tell you the secret, and you'll be very happy to hear it, because, you know, because of scoops, um, you will go to that other general of the Air Force only if he approves and give you the same reporting and uh, confirm that he will be quoted with his name, then you will publish. If he does not, uh, you don't. You just don't publish. 
promise me. He said, of course, yes, I just wanted to hear the story. He said, no, <laughs> promise. <laughs> I said, I promise. And then he tells me the unbelievable story that after this 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon, Arafat and his troops were um, uh, kicked or, or le left Beirut that was under siege. And Ariel Sharon, who understood that this, is going to, that this invasion is going to destroy his political career, ordered to take out a commercial airline flying over the Mediterranean with hundreds of passengers on board because Arafat was there. And the supreme, command, the supreme command of the Air Force rebelled against him and said, we are not going to stain the, for, forever the, 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 the reputation of, of, of Israel in this horrible war crime. Those innocent civilians did, did nothing. And they jammed the, the um, uh, communication and they uh, misled the, the, the operation and they made it impossible. Now, this is a big story. Uh, and I said, oh, wonderful. And he said, no, you promised me. <laughs> you go to the other general. And I said, but you know him. He will never speak with me. He's like this old guard. They never speak with journalists. He will, he will and, and this is a specific story. How can, he said, I don't, know, I don't care. You promised. I went to the other general. And for like an hour, I circled around. I didn't ask him a direct question. And um, at a certain point, he said, Ron, why, why are you here? Mm. Why, that's, uh, you are doing so. That's, that's, you are not because of that question or the other. And, I, and then I, I asked, I said, listen, was there a case where you were commanding the Air Force and uh, um, you had to disobey a direct order to take out a commercial airline? And suddenly his gaze, he's a tough general, his gaze changed, softened. This was 2012, and he looked at me and he said, 30 years I was waiting for someone to come and ask me this question. <laughs> Wait here. He stands up. It's a huge office. He walks to the other side. He moves the furniture. There's a safe. He opens the safe. He comes back with all the documents of that operation that he was guarding for that day that someone would come and ask the question. Bit of a journalist dream that moment, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I say. Which, which, which brings me on maybe naturally to the next question, which is, uh, how do you write a book like this? I mean, and how, uh, you, you know, you've given us a bit of an insight into how you get people to talk. And, you know, people, people are often proud of their stories even when they're secret. And I think, you know, as a journalist, you know, you can sometimes, you know, work it out and then cross-reference it and, you know, play on their desire even to have their secret stories told. I mean, but was it, did you find obstruction, intimidation when you were doing it as well? Um, I, I think that a question can be asked, should be asked. How do you know, you write about spies, and how do you know they, they, they did not do the case officer tricks on you? you know, those are the masters of manipulation. They devoted their life to convince other people to betray or give them information. Um, lie. Uh, so how do you know, how do you make them talk? And when they talk, how do you know it's true? Um, I was, uh, in 2010, early 2010, I was asked by Random House if I'm willing to write the history of the Mossad and the history of targeted killings. And I said, yes, yeah, sure, why not? You know, the, the history of the most secretive organization on earth. Uh, sure. And they said, all right, how long do, will they Will that take you? And I said, a year. Now, that's really, you know, completely miscalculation of times. And, I, and they said, uh, are you sure? I said, yeah, I'm sure. I know, I, I know how much time everything will take me. I'm very precise and, and, and um, uh, strict on deadlines. It will take me a year. They said, maybe we write a year and a half in the contract so you won't be in violation. I said, you can write whatever you want. It will take me a year. Because I thought I have everything in my archive. I'm just going to you know, edit this differently and, and publish. Um, and they, they still wrote a year and a half. And after that, I was six years delayed. <laughs> so I, Patient publishers. But, yeah, <laughs> on the deadline. And the reason was because I decided to disregard everything that was published on Israeli intelligence that far, because it was unreferenced, no footnotes, and much of it just didn't make any sense. And I decided to start from scratch and interview everybody again, hoping that maybe they you know, forgot in their possession some documents from their service that they're willing to share. Um, 
And I ended up with a list of 1,000 interviews. And some of them I had to see a few times because they were not very keen to speak at, the, at first. Um, and so this was a long eight years journey to get those people to talk, to get the general, to get the chiefs of the Mossad, to, um, to, get, so, to get the prime minister, the minister of defense, the chiefs of staff, the chiefs of the Mossad, but also get the, the, the operatives, the assassins, the intelligence officers, the, the cyber experts, get all of them in order to build a database that would be um, stronger than any attempt to maneuver and lie to me. Now, I cannot say that they were completely unsuccessful, but I think that the attempts either to lie and the attempts of the Mossad to block my way to those sources, as you can see from the many pages, but it runs fast. Do not be, you know, <laughs> do not be disencouraged from, uh, from the, from the uh, uh, length. Um, I think that most of those, those uh, attempts were, were not successful. Uh, when I gave the, the book to, to Random House, six years delay, they said, but how come all of them spoke? Mm. Like most of them on the record, speaking about things that they are forbidden, nobody got permission. Um, they told me, I'm telling you things that my wife doesn't know. <laughs> and I said, you know, each of the interviewee and the story of, you know, the negotiation, and how was, was I able to convince him? But if there's a common ground, I think that after so many years in the twilight zone of secrecy, in the, shade, in the shadows, they wanted to make sure that their imprint, their footprint, is set up right in Israeli history. Um, and if they were not um, keen or cooperative enough, uh, I did to them what makes Israelis by far more ballistic than anything else. I coincidentally, just by the way, during the, the correspondence between us, I said that someone else took credit for their operation. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know how many of you speak Hebrew, but there is a word in Hebrew um, that refers to, I think the, it's fire. Fire is like the highest level of sucker. Israelis hate most to be a fire. And if someone takes credit for their operation, that's the worst. And he, they usually say, ah, that's what they said. Now I'm going to give you the whole story. <laughs> Good tricks here for any, uh, for any uh, budding writers or journalists, I think. I, I wonder, um, I mean, this gets me to, the, to a question I wanted to ask about kind of uh, whether it works, efficacy, but also whether people reflect on it afterwards. I mean, I, I remember watching a, a fascinating Israeli documentary a few years ago called The Gatekeepers, yep. which was about, primarily about Shin Bet, the, yep. the, the domestic... chiefs of the Shin And Bet. the chiefs of the Shin Bet went on camera and talked about it. And it was fascinating because they talked about some of these targeted killing operations. But then, uh, and, and when they were, in the moment you sensed, you know, why they felt it was necessary. But then at the end of the program, they kind of pulled back and they said, they, they kind of reflected and it felt like they were saying, but we were doing all this tactical stuff. We were fighting these day-to-day -day battles. We weren't dealing with the, the big strategic problems and the political solutions, the things that would resolve this conflict. We were just, we were caught up in this, in the can we kill this person, should we, and that side of things. I mean, do you sense, you know, reading your book, I feel like this culture has developed about using targeted killings in Israel. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if people do reflect on whether it's become a kind of, uh, something kind of, a, 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 you know, something they reach for very quickly and is part of the culture, or whether some people reflect and go, hang on a sec, is, it, 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 is, this, is this what our intelligence agency should be? I mean, because in some ways it feels like they've become uh, targeted killings machines, these intelligence agencies, more than if you like classic you know, intelligence services. Um, the Israeli intelligence killed more people than any other Western intelligence service after the Second World War. Uh, they are one of the only who use targeted killings. I, I'm not, I don't want to um, you know, send anyone, but James Bond isn't real. <laughs> there is no double O program at MI6. And the uniqueness of Israeli intelligence is, this is what David Ben-Gurion was hoping to create, uh, knowing 
that Israel cannot sustain long wars and all-out wars happening frequently. And David Ben-Gurion knew that in order to prevent all-out wars, uh, he needs to have a very strong intelligence community that would not just bring the intelligence from behind the enemy lines. This is important and still um, one of the main tasks, if not the main task of, of Israeli intelligence, but also translate the intelligence into special operations way beyond enemy lines in order to prevent the war or at least delay that and tackle the immediate threats <coughs> day after day. And so while most intelligence services, what they do is collect intelligence, um, Mossad, you know, the Mossad is just, the uh, translation is the institution. But the full name is the Institution for Intelligence and Special Operations. So by its name, you understand this is a very unique intelligence organization. And the need to operate dictates the mindset and dictates, of course, the, um, uh, the, the way the organization works and the need to um, answer threats, immediate threats. Now, of course, uh, you know, there's a book about the, the CIA of, of a good friend of mine called T. Weiner called Legacy of Ashes. Basically saying that the CIA, uh, and I'm not sure, you know, General Petraeus was just here, uh, and I'm not sure that, that it's true, uh, but that's the, the way that the, the book describes that everything the CIA was doing failed. I think that Israeli intelligence has a problem of over-success in a way, and they failed many times, but in a way, I think they were able to present to the political level, the political leaders of Israel, a solution sooner or later for any kind of challenge that those political posed to the intelligence services. And that created a well, numerous of tactical successes. But yet, with the political leaders, the wrong impression that they have those exotic capabilities at the tip of the fingers, that they can kill anyone, they can um, you know, explode the facility, and the illusion that with force, targeted force, and those really mind-blowing operations, they can solve every problem. Mm. And when you have a hammer, you are looking for a nail. When you have a hammer, you don't resort to other means of corresponding with the enemy, like diplomacy, which are much more risky for a politician. Therefore, the story, in a way, is really remarkable uh, movie, TV series worth um, operations, tactical successes, but also a strategic problem or strategic failure. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, I think now might be a good moment for questions. I've got lots more. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? I can see one gentleman over here and a lady here. I'll just let the lady here go first, just while the mic makes its way there. Oops. Can I just say how wonderful it was listening to you this afternoon? I'm afraid it's, I'm very upset you've stopped. <laughs> um, I saw a wonderful film last year called The Spy, which is based on Eli Cohen, who was a, a, a spy for Mossad. So my question is, how true is that story? And secondly, do you ever think his body will be returned to his family from Syria? Hmm. Eli Cohen is the, maybe the, the worst failure and the biggest myth and legend in Mossad. He was uh, born in Egypt to a Jewish Syrian family that emigrated to, to Egypt. Um, he uh, emigrated to Israel uh, upon his request, was recruited to Mossad, sent to Argentina to build a cover story, then to Damascus, where he was um, the only Israeli Jewish agent at that time, uh, was able to penetrate the highest echelons of the Syrian regime. Um, and then he was exposed, sentenced, or tortured, sentenced, and, and executed. Um, much of the series is true. Uh, I would say, of course, um, myths 
do not necessarily need to be all supported by facts. Um, at the end of the day, he was the one person uh, who had some access, but I think that describing what he brought to Israel as you know, the um, grain of intelligence that, that made Israel win the Six-Day War is uh, a little bit too much. But the bravery, the sacrifice, uh, the, his ability to uh, come out as Syrian uh, and be in contact with high-ranked Syrian official, this is all very, very true. And his legacy, the Mossad Academy is named after him, and his legacy is, um, I'd say, hovering over everything Mossad is, is, is doing. And uh, uh, Yana, my wife, sitting here, and myself, we were just uh, uh, on stage uh, with Mossad chief, uh, the last Mossad chief, Yossi Cohen, in Chicago, and he mentioned uh, the uh, the story of Eli Cohen and uh, uh, I spoke with his with his widow uh, Nadia yesterday and they are building a museum to uh, honor his his memory the body I think that the Syrians don't know where, where is the body they have hidden that so well so Israel would not snap it so they they don't know that and I think that the chances of Israel getting back is the the body are very slim they got the watch. Uh, the, one of the the, so the 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 grandson of one of the interrogators kept, but I think that's going to be the end of it. Thank you. I think there was a question from a gentleman over here. Who maybe has some more. Uh, Ronan, a, a country that is notorious for extraterritorial targeted assassinations is Rwanda, and Paul Kagame seems to pick off his political enemies around the world one by one whenever he wants to, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering whether Mossad has any connection with the Rwandan people who do that? I uh, must say, I'm, I'm getting every week questions about Mossad connection to possibly all of those horrible stories. Uh, uh, the story of Epstein, possible connection of Mossad. He was a Mossad recruit because he was connected to the daughter of uh, late Robert Maxwell is, is one of them. Um, of course, I don't know everything, but I, I don't think that, that uh, Mossad has anything to do. Uh, Mossad is trying to keep away uh, from things that are not directly connected to the threats against Israel. Things that Israeli, it's not just Mossad, the things that the Israeli defense establishment is doing to confront those threats are uh, you know, creating enough bad publicity for Israel that Israel is not looking to be involved in other, uh, other affairs. Uh, this is, I think this is enough. Uh, the use, of, the use of, 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 of targeted killing as a main weapon was highly, or is highly debated. Um, and when Israel started to use that uh, against the Palestinians, uh, against the suicide bombers, or the commanders, in 2001, Jacques Chirac, then French uh, president, was furious. And the Elysee and Ken the uh, French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, attacked Israel every day for that. So Ariel Sharon, Israeli prime minister, when he came to speak with Chirac at the Elysee, he asked the deputy chief of Shin Bet, the domestic secret, to come and present. Uh, and Rise and Kill has the minutes of that meeting or the description from the the deputy commander of Shin Bet, he said, so Chirac was there, Ariel Sharon was in front of him, and the, the intelligence official to the right of Sharon, they served food, but Chirac was speaking. And it's impolite to start eating when the president is speaking. Now Sharon, I don't know if you remember, but he was uh, very, one of his main habits was to eat. <laughs> so, the, the official, the intelligence official, his name is Diskin. Diskin, he says, I see the prime minister, and he's suffering so much that the president <laughs> is talking and talking, and he needs to answer. At a certain point, the prime minister whispered, Diskin, in, in Hebrew, this thing, start your presentation. So Diskin said, Mr. Prime Minister, the president is talking. I cannot start. He said, I don't care. I need to eat. Start speaking. <laughs> so they start talking. 
and this can explain to Shirak the mechanism of targeted killing, something that happened just a week earlier, and how they killed someone who was planning to do more, who already killed a lot of people, or sent suicide bombers to kill people, and he was planning to do more. At the end of that conversation, Sharon was happy because he ate a lot. Shirak was happy, he said, you know, 4,000 kilometers away, it looks different, I understand, and it did moderate the Elise criticism on targeted killing. Two weeks later, Sharon goes to uh, Moscow, to the Kremlin, to meet with Putin. So he said, we're going to do the same show. He said to Diskin, you come with me. They stand in some kind of a cocktail before dinner, and Diskin is you know, standing a few meters away, and then Sharon uh, gives him the, uh, the sign, and he approaches them, and he introduces Putin to, he says, this is deputy commander of our intelligence service, Mr. Diskin, and now Mr. Diskin will explain to you why is it uh, the, only weapon, the, we the only weapon we can use is targeted killing. And this can start the same presentation and again. Putin cuts him after two sentences and said, I don't care, you can kill all of them, let's go and eat something. <laughs> <laughs> so here you have the difference between two presidents. Yeah, and we've seen Russian targeted killings in this, in this country, of course. So um, uh, we know what's, uh, what, 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 what that looks like. Uh, yes, I have a question here, thank you. Thank you for the fascinating discussion. I'll certainly buy the book. Um, over here. Uh, just uh, wondered... I'll, 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 I'll keep track. <laughs> <laughs> just, just wondered what your thoughts are. You talked about sort of nuclear proliferation by A.Q. Khan earlier, but what are your thoughts on kind of that happening in the other directions? I'm thinking of kind of Pegasus, um, about sort of phone hacking technology and I mean how worried should we all be that you know uh, anything is available to anyone and you know are Israeli sort of is the establishment also kind of worried about this what are, what are your thoughts uh. Uh, I smiled because uh, <clears throat> the, I, I, I cannot scoop myself there's a big report coming about that um, and so this will have, not, my thoughts are not important, but it will have, I think, uh, important stories about NSO and Pegasus. Pegasus, you know, the cyber weapon that is able to hack into all of our phones. Um, we just, uh, we just visit uh, NSO, that's the Israeli company manufacturing Pegasus. Um, recently, they have a, a room, it's as big as this stage. It's, long, it's like a huge safe with strong white neon light and shelves on the walls. And the gap between the shelves is something like that, so it's like a mobile and a little bit more. And on the shelves, you have all the mobile in the use, of the different kinds, in the use of mankind. All of them are turned on. And all of them are connected to the mainframe. So each hacker working for NSO can try his new virus, his new Trojan horse, his new Pegasus, on each of the phones all the time. It, just, it doesn't need to take physically to take the phone and hook it. And it's scary. Mm. You, know, you look at those screens and you think about your phone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, um, I, many people, you didn't ask, but sometimes, sometimes people say, aren't you afraid that the Israeli intelligence, Mossad, is trying to reveal your sources and, and hack your phone and, and, and surveil you and, and, and watch you. And, uh, and I, I recall that movie, I don't know if you saw it, uh, uh, Life of Others, yeah. where the Stasi case, uh, Stasi head of, of surveillance unit is falling in love with the life of the couple that he is thinking of you know, being maybe rogue or not loyal to the communist regime. So I said, if someone asked me about, if I am not afraid to be a target, I said, first, I'm not important enough. I don't think so. And, and second, if they surveil uh, me and they see what great life Jana and I have, they deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but, but this is, you know, jokes aside, what is unique in Pegasus that was the question, right? What is unique in Pegasus is that it has 
the ability, it's a weapon that can do something that no other weapon can. It can target and destroy the civil society of every country. Mm. Because the civil society of a country, including us journalists and, and human rights activists and lawyers and, and, and um, um, uh, some, any, any kind of opposition to the regime, now, nowadays, their main means of communication are the encrypted apps, so WhatsApp and Signal and Telegram, uh, that everybody uses and are supposed to be immune, end-to-end -end encryption. And Pegasus is looking exactly at those. Now, this is not easy to do because the main telecom and internet companies in America are trying to block all the vulnerabilities and the zero days that, that Pegasus is hacking the phone through. But Pegasus, every day, every minute, they have 500 hackers trying to hack those phones in that vault and bypass the, 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 the securities. And where unique cyber capabilities back in times, um, uh, Michael Hayden once said, uh, told me, you know, in old times it was very, Michael Hayden was the chief of the NSA and the CIA. He said in old times it was easy for us, not easy, but relatively easy. If we wanted to know when the Kremlin orders the secret um, nuclear missile site in the Ural Mountains to launch against the US, we needed to hook into that encrypted phone line between, the, between Moscow and Europe. That's it. But now, with those encrypted means, it's vast terabytes of, of information. And unlike in old times when you had few superpowers with the ability to do that, so to hook to that specific phone line, you have private companies like NSO who proliferate military-grade knowledge and experience because people working for NSO are former employees of Israeli intelligence. And they proliferate those capabilities to countries that without them have no mm. ability to do so. Now, it works against organized crime. It works against, this is the only way to crack organized crimes, pedophile networks, it's horrible things are prevented with the use of Pegasus. But also, it helps tyranny regimes hack, destroy their civil societies. And this is the, this is the main threat. And I don't, I don't see, unless there's a, like international supervision, which I don't know what's the shape of, I don't see a solution to no, that. No, I think that kind of commercialization and commodify commodification of spying yeah. is very... And privatization of, of, of um, you know, yeah. deep states. I mean, these kind of techniques which were once, you know, the province of only top spy agencies, and now you can buy them off the shelf whether you're in another country or even individuals, you know, and everything from satellite footage to kind of yeah. search capabilities. So right. It's, yeah. it's going to be a different world. Well, and and NSO, NSO charges just for the delivery 50 million and then 100,000 for each attack. So this is not off the shelf. Yeah. And you need... <laughs> Depends. Depends. <laughs> um, and you need a license from the Israeli Ministry of Defense, which is another, of course, question of how mm. come Israeli Ministry of Defense. And, but by the way, it's not just Israel. Uh, France is now furious that Pegasus was used by Moroccan intelligence to hack to Macron's phone. But, you know, the U.S. hacked Angela Merkel's phone. <laughs> France sold their oh, private French company with the license permit from the French Ministry of, of Defense to, to, to Turkish intelligence who are using that uh, system to hack Israeli phones. Mm. <laughs> it's endless. <laughs> it is. I'm afraid our time is not endless, though. Uh, and I'm very sorry to say I could have kept going for another hour, uh, and I'm sure you could have done as well. But uh, it just leaves me to say thank you very much indeed thank to Roland Bergman. <laughs> Thank you for coming. And there'll be a signing at the bookshop as well. So, um...